Hey everybody, Charles from HumbleMechanics.com. Today we're going to be diagnosing the check engine light on my 2005 Passat. So as many other Volkswagen drivers have experienced, the check engine light came on in my Passat a couple of days ago, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to walk you guys through what my diagnostic process is when I get a car with a check engine light. Now, this is an at-home diagnostic process, so it's a little bit different than what I would do at the dealership, but not really all that much. The process is very similar. Some of the equipment is a little bit different, though. For this job, we're going to be using my laptop, VAGCOM, which, which on VAGCOM I do use almost all the time at the shop, unless it's a warranty job. Uh, flat blade screwdriver, a Phillips head screwdriver, probably the worst quality hose clamp pliers I have ever seen. I actually got these for free. I think I found them under a hood of a car or something like that. They're terrible, but it's the only thing I have at the house. And a little bit of brain power. So one of the first things we want to do when our check engine light comes on is evaluate the vehicle because if it doesn't feel safe to drive, we don't want to drive it. Generally, that comes along with a flashing check engine light, but not always. So on my car, there wasn't really any kind of drivability concern. The only weird thing I noticed is when I got home from work the day before it came on, the idle was a little bit high when I stopped in my driveway. It was about 300 RPM higher than it normally sits, something that probably a lot of people wouldn't have noticed, but it sort of caught my eye. I shut the car off and didn't think twice about it, honestly, till the next morning when the check engine light came on. Next, what we're gonna wanna do is pull our fault. You can see here we're using VAGCOM, and we're gonna go into the engine, then we're gonna go into the fault codes and see what we have. Now, there's four fault codes listed. They all sort of point to a fuel trim issue. When we have a system lean issue, we want to be thinking vacuum leak or reduced fuel pressure. It really all depends on what engine we're working with. This engine right here, the 1.8 Turbo Passat, was notorious for broken vacuum lines. There's a ton, as we'll see in a minute, of vacuum lines underneath the hood of this car, and uh, all of them were prone to break. A lot of them are plastic that get brittle over time. So we have four faults that we're going to look at individually, but we're also going to look at them as a group. Now let's say we had these four faults, and in addition to that, we had, I don't know, a catalytic converter fault. Those we might want to separate and diagnose individually, but because all, all of these are related to fuel trim, they say system lean, we're gonna treat these all as one thing. Now that we know what our codes are, this is going to point us in the direction of what we need to do next. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into measuring value block 32. This is one of the key measuring value blocks when it comes to diagnosing fuel trim issues. Now, this is not the only value block that you wanna use when you're diagnosing serious fuel trim issues or complicated fuel trim issues. This is usually one of my first go-to. What we're looking at here in measuring value block 32, field one is going to be the at idle fuel trim. Now, what that means is our ECM is compensating for something going on. You can see a measurement of 6.6%. Whenever the number in this field is positive, that means that the vehicle is adding fuel to keep the engine running properly. If this were a negative number, that would mean we were pulling fuel away in order to keep the engine running properly. The goal of the ECM here and what we're looking at is to make sure that the car is running as good as it possibly can while overcoming obstacles. Things like vacuum leaks, things like weak fuel pumps can generally be seen by evaluating measuring value block 32. Now, if we move over to field two, which is a much smaller number, we'll also notice that that's positive. So even off idle or part throttle, we're adding fuel. This is a value block that a lot of people really tend to look at the wrong way. Some people call this short-term and long-term fuel trims, which isn't really correct. If we wanna look at an immediate fuel trim change, we can look somewhere else, but this is at idle and off idle. So we need to make sure we're looking at it that way. Also, people get confused with system lean and system rich faults. The way I've always looked at this is not in terms of rich and lean. When we go to value block 32, we can see what the computer's doing. It's adding fuel. So I look at it more of, are we adding fuel or are we taking away fuel? And why would we wanna do that? Now, it gets really fun on turbocharged cars when we compare our idle readings to our off idle readings. If we're looking in terms of a vacuum leak, of course we're going to be adding fuel because we're adding extra air that's coming into the engine unmonitored. But when we get into a boost situation, that changes because instead of pulling extra air in, we're actually blowing air out. We're leaking boost. So our pressure is going out of, let's say, the intercooler. 
Now we actually have less air than we expected to have, so we have to pull fuel away. So be very careful monitoring measuring value lock 32 on turbocharged cars under load. But back to our problem, this is more of an idle problem. This is a problem that we're experiencing while the car is just sitting under no load, only while running. The next thing we wanna do is take a really good visual inspection under the hood. We wanna look for things like the dipstick not being pushed down or the oil cap not being tight. That doesn't create quite the issue that it does on the newer generation, but it's still something we wanna look at. Now we're going to find all the vacuum lines underneath the hood and inspect them. Now, there's a ton of vacuum lines, like I said, underneath the hood of this car. We have them near the air box. We have them near the intake manifold, behind the intake manifold, under the intake manifold, as well as along the front of the car where we're dealing with the diverter valve. So the key here is taking your time and doing a good thorough inspection. When I start the car up, I could actually hear a slight hiss of a vacuum leak. And where I'm hearing that is near the intake manifold, so I'm going to go ahead and really focus my efforts there. Unfortunately, showing what I'm doing with a camera is really hard. This is not a hard engine to work on, but seeing things through the eye of a camera can be a little bit challenging, so we're gonna do our best here and try and weave our way through all of these vacuum lines. I'm gonna also go ahead and pull the coolant bottle off, as well as the engine cover, just to open up the engine bay a little bit and give me more room to work, and honestly, just more room to shove my camera down so you guys can see what I'm doing. I'm gonna start here at the back. A really good strategy is to take a flat blade screwdriver and sort of poke very, very, extremely, very gently on these vacuum lines. You may find that a vacuum line actually breaks by that soft touch. Well, odds are that was what the problem was, so we can start and focus our repair in that point. Now, I poked around and didn't really find anything. Nothing seemed to change with just moving things with a screwdriver. So now we're gonna go to our next step, and that's going to be clamping off different vacuum lines in order to affect the engine. We're gonna start with the easy ones. This big line right here is really easy to get to. Again, like I said in the beginning, these hose clamp pliers are absolutely terrible, but we're gonna go ahead and give it a shot. It's all we have. You really wanna get a good quality hose clamp if you're going to be doing this kind of diagnosis. We can look at two things here. We can listen to what the engine's doing. Is it changing RPM? Does it seem to smooth out the idle a little bit? Does the hiss go away? We can also evaluate our measuring value block 32 while we're doing this. If we happen to come across our problem while we're pinching off lines, we'll probably see that field one in measuring value block 32 start to drop and drop and drop as the ECM sees that it doesn't have to add as much fuel as it used to. Now, unfortunately, you can only get on so many of the hoses with big hose clamp pliers like this. So our next step, honestly, is just going to be feeling around and trying to get to the point where we find something happen. By taking the coolant bottle out, that gives us room to stick our arm underneath the intake manifold and sort of feel around to see if we can maybe feel air getting sucked in or find a weak point or a hole. Now you can also take something like carburetor cleaner or intake cleaner and spray it along the, uh, the, the hoses there and that may change. You know, that's a really good way to find a vacuum leak too. If you hit one of those places that's leaking vacuum and pulling extra air in, with some carburetor cleaner, it generally jumps the RPM up. But since I don't have any carburetor cleaner at home, that's not something I'm gonna be able to do. Before we get too involved, we also wanna take a look between the runners of the intake manifold and look at the PCV system. You can kind of sort of see here that there's a little bit of oil residue around the PCV hoses that come up out of the oil filter housing and go to various locations throughout the engine. Because there's this oil residue, we probably have some kind of leak in this area. They're not hard to get to, they're just really hard to get a camera in to show you guys. Oh! <laughs> well, I don't know if that was the overall problem, I'm guessing it was, but it is now the problem because this piece just broke. So, this is actually part of, this is actually part of the PCV system. And the second I laid my hand on it, 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 uh, it just shattered. You see the engine rev up. Our fuel trim hasn't really changed, but you can actually hear now the car's running quite a bit louder. So I think we went ahead and <laughs> inadvertently both found and made worse our check engine light problem. 
So the next step is going to be replacing these PCV hoses. It's almost always recommended that when this hose breaks that we go through and we replace all of that. It all has the same age on it, all has the same mileage on it. It's all been saturated in oil a little bit for a while. So we're gonna go ahead and replace all of that. But that's gonna be a video for another time. So when that video's done, I'll be sure to link it up, be on the lookout for a DIY on the PCV hoses on a 1.8 Turbo Passat. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comments section below. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. Don't forget to subscribe because we're gonna be doing the DIY video of this soon. You guys can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously right here on YouTube. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.